Hello everyone, I hope this message finds you well as we begin to kick off the 2020-2021 budget season and the discussions associated with that. I want to provide you with some insight to the budget development, uh, where we stand as of today in late February, uh, as well as where we'll be going towards uh, the end of April as the Board of Education gets set to adopt a budget. As we look at some current facts uh, about Roma, enrollment is just under 6,000 students. We have a slight decline from last year. Uh, but improving is our expenses per pupil. Uh, as you can see in the slide that we have, uh, just under $21,000 per pupil in expenses. Uh, and some things to note that uh, we do rank 620th out of 669 school districts in the state of New York for per pupil spending. Uh, and we are one of 53 school districts uh, across the state that is decreasing costs in the past several years. Uh, and I point that out to note that a lot of the things that we're going to talk about uh, later in this presentation are related to revenue issues, which is the money that comes in the door, and not expenditure issues, which is the things that we are utilizing our money for. The, the district and our staff, our teachers, administrators, uh, support staff throughout the district have done a great job trying to reduce expenses and control costs. Uh, and I do think that's highlighted by some of those numbers. Our combined wealth ratio for this year is 0.392. Uh, for those, again, that are, are learning more about combined wealth ratio and school budgeting finance, combined wealth ratio is the state's measure of your district wealth. A 1.0 would be a considered an average wealth in the state of New York. Uh, there are 57 small city school districts in New York State, and of those 57, 0 0.670 is the average combined wealth ratio. So you can see that we are well below average wealth for the state. Uh, but we are also well below the average wealth for uh, small city school districts in the state of New York. Important to know is 96% of our budget is what's considered a fixed expense or a fixed cost, meaning we don't really have much control over that money uh, that's going out the door. Most of that's associated to uh, benefits, uh, pension plans, things like that through the state, uh, contractual requirements and agreements that we have. So just under $5 million of our budget is what would be considered something that we can actually make a difference on. Also of note, our total expenses per general education student is about $10,657, and our total expense per special education pupil uh, is $24,608. You can see that sometimes there are other expenses uh, that might come along with our special education population. Fortunately for Rome, we are known as a district that has a great special education team, a great special education department, uh, and that does draw families to our community, which in turn can incur some additional expenses. Uh, the last thing on this slide that you uh, need to know about is what's considered the contingent tax levy, which is $35,161,231. That simply refers to the amount of total dollars of taxes that we can collect uh, if our budget is defeated uh, during the cycle. Moving on, I want to look at a few of our achievements uh, in the past year. These are academic achievements that we've seen over the past 12 months, we've got 91% of our students uh, obtaining a Regents Diploma. 32.7% uh, of them are obtaining what's called a Regents Diploma the Advanced Designation. That means uh, those students are achieving above and beyond relative to some of the Regents testing requirements. 58 students are received the CTE endorsement, the Career and Technical Education endorsement, uh, meaning they've gone above and beyond doing works in the trades uh, to achieve a seal on their diploma. Those SEALs, the CTE endorsements, help students that are moving into technical fields, uh, engineering, uh, trade skills, and that endorsement does help them get jobs out of high school and or uh, helps them get into certain colleges relative to those fields. Our completer rate uh, dipped slightly this year down to 78%. That's the total number of students or percentage of students that complete high school in four years. Uh, 202 of our recent graduates are attending a two- or four-year college, and 29 students went directly into the workforce. After we hear about some of those things, as we get to talk about the budget development, we need to look at some of the challenges and what we do uh, amidst those challenges relative to the big picture. The governor's executive budget is always a challenge for school districts. This year, and I'll highlight this a little bit later on, the governor uh, has made some changes to the way in which he... Uh, presents funding to schools and he has renamed some things that makes it more challenging for schools to kind of understand their aid numbers. 
uh, and that one being the state aid formula and the foundation aid formula. Uh, he has added things to foundation aid to make it look like schools are getting more money than they may have last year. Uh, when in fact we're getting uh, slightly more money, but not the amount that the numbers make it look. And, and what's been a challenge the past several weeks for school business offices is trying to kind of unpack uh, these new formulas that they're using and the way in which the language is that they're using to describe these to us. We continue to see underfunded mandates. Those of you that work in schools know that every year there's more and more things that you're asked to do that are required by the state, uh, and we need to answer that bell. The federal and state uncertainties, obviously the state has not approved a budget. That happens at the beginning of April. Federal funding for education is not approved or finalized till August. So a lot of the discussions that we have today uh, and for the next several months, even into the budget vote in May, are without knowing what's going to happen at the federal level while it's relative to education funding. Uh, we have dwindling remaining resources or reserves uh, in our bank accounts to be able to offset any budget holes that are there. We continue to want to educate uh, our staff in the community on how school budgeting works and how budgets are developed and how school finance plays out. Uh, very little flexibility. Again, we talked about fixed expenses. I will talk a little bit about statewide trends uh, in this presentation to kind of highlight uh, what's happening around the state and how that differs from what's happening here in Rome and what we're trying to do about that. I have said in the past that we are living in a new normal uh, and the past decade for schools has been new. Uh, however, we're at the point where this issue is going to be seen for the foreseeable future where revenues are shortfalling expenditures greatly. So uh, in my opinion, it's time for us to take this into our own hands and build our new normal. We need a new normal in Rome. We have the opportunity to control that uh, through our own actions and our own decision making relative to how we want our schools to look without the need of funding from um, relying on Albany to, to come through for us. Last thing about our proposed budget for, for the year does fall within the governor's tax cap, which is 2.1%. I will talk a little bit more about why the tax cap is important uh, later on in this presentation. Something new this year to my presentation, I want to point out a, a simple math problem for you. And this math problem is meant to highlight kind of the process of school budgeting and what goes into it. So uh, trying to compare a multi-million dollar school budget possibly to your personal life, if you think about it this way, you need to buy groceries, uh, but the law says you can only buy groceries one time a year. Um, you must also have your grocery list planned and approved two months before that year starts. And you think you have $45,000 for the year for all of your purchases, and you can reasonably use about $5,000 of that for your groceries uh, so that you have money to cover all your other bills. The, the un one of the unfortunate things here is halfway through the year, you're told what your actual income might be for the year. It might not be $45,000. Could be more if you're lucky, and it, it could be less. You just don't know. Uh, in building a grocery list, you have to predict all possible prices as far as 15 months into the future. Uh, you have to plan for sudden changes in potential dietary needs for you and your family. Uh, and you can't spend more than what you ask for uh, 15 months before the end of the cycle happens uh, that your grocery season is going to happen in. Once you complete your first grocery list, you realize you are expecting to plan to spend you know, $6,100. Knowing you can't spend more than you ask for, but you can spend less, what are you going to do? This highlights and compares school budgeting to your personal life to some degree. School budgeting is a process where we are asked to try to figure out what's going to happen sometimes a year and a half from now. We don't have all of the figures relative to what our revenue is going to be. And we also don't know what might happen with expenditures. Expenditures can change greatly during the course of the year. Um, your student population can change. More students can come into your district. Uh, you could find that you have significant educational needs that you want to provide resources to uh, in the middle portion of the year to try and help support students, staff, and families. And the moving target is constant when it comes to school budgeting. A lot of people think it's an easy process where you just say, this is how much money we're going to spend, this is how much we need, uh, and you go with it. And that's not the case at all. And, and in fact, it becomes very challenging. A lot of times you hear that people want to say the sky is always falling because it is. Uh, our revenues are 
greatly less than our actual planned expenditures on a year over year basis. We've been able to use reserves uh, for the past decade to stem off some of that difference. Uh, and also, as we had talked about earlier, we are reducing expenditures year over year uh, to try and help mitigate some of that problem. But the, the bottom line is we don't control our revenue. Our revenue is the big source of the issue. And when it comes to school budgeting, you have to plan to uh, spend more than you might need in the event that things change halfway through the year that you uh, don't expect because you can't go back to the well once it, it hap you get to that point. Uh, unfortunately, like a, unlike a government, uh, we don't have the ability to do that, whereas they can ask for additional monies throughout the budget cycle and find ways to do that. We are in a process where you see similar to this math problem where we have to try and predict well in advance what's going to happen uh, both in the school district, in the market, and with finance uh, 18 months before the issues are even uh, known. Now that we've discussed a little bit about how a budget is built and the concerns relative to revenue, let's just take a look at our uh, estimated revenues for 2020 and 2021 school year along with our three-year comparisons. You can see on this slide, we are projecting um, a uh, slight tax increase uh, over the year. A 2.1% increase would equate to about $738,000 of increased tax revenue. Um, star reimbursement stays the same. As you come down through here, foundation aid, if you look, shows a significant increase of $1.6 million. However, the way the governor has done foundation aid this year, he's rolled in all of your BOCES aid as well. So most of that $1.6 million increase in aid comes from our BOCES aid reimbursement. Uh, the actual aid uh, increase from the state is roughly $600,000, $700,000 as well. Uh, transportation aid is up a little bit. Building aid is down. Building aid is the amount of money you receive back from previous building projects. So because we have some building projects coming off of the books for expenditures, uh, that aid is in turn uh, reduced slightly. So overall, from uh, this current projected year to uh, next year, you can see there's a slight decrease in projected revenue. Uh, in a perfect world, we would be building a budget for $114 million $572,177. However, uh, right now that is not the case. Moving on from the estimated revenues, when you start talking about uh, foundation aid, uh, I just want to try and highlight a little bit of where we have gone. In the past, you've seen this foundation aid formula in our presentations. There's a lot of different inputs that go into this formula. This is what is supposed to happen. This is what the, the, the numbers are supposed to go in. It puts out a final uh, number for foundation aid and then uh, districts are supposed to receive whatever that number is. In the past, we've talked about how that isn't the case. This year, I'm just gonna use a little humor and highlight for you what uh, the foundation aid formula kind of really runs like. Uh, as you can see, you start with the formula here. Uh, they put all the numbers in, it spits out uh, what districts should receive, and somebody somewhere says, no, nope, we don't like those numbers. So then you fast forward, uh, and they have Homer Simpson at the chalkboard trying to do some math, uh, looking about some donuts and how the math and donuts work out. And that spits out some numbers that uh, also are no good, so people don't like that. And then they go back to the drawing board and now it seems like they're just throwing darts at a dartboard trying to figure out a number and lo and behold all of a sudden we have this map in New York State. And if you blow this map up and you will see different pockets of red, those are districts that are in significant financial crisis uh, for not being able to meet their budgetary needs this year. Uh, darker colors uh, indicate districts that are getting close to that. Right now, out of 669 districts, Rome ranks 40th relative to the ability to make ends meet uh, as you look at revenue versus your expenditure, your budget. So unfortunately, the foundation aid formula is not used. And what happens is they put the numbers in, they get the aid number out, and then they start playing with it and manipulating it. Some districts get 300% of their foundation aid formula. Other districts get 50% of that aid formula. And we're at the point today where, as I mentioned earlier, the governor has done some things with the aid formula himself. So we don't really know anymore uh, how the aid formula works and what the aid formula numbers really should be. Uh, continuing to talk about some things here relative to foundation aid, a quick analysis. Uh, and this will highlight the part that I'm talking about with some changes in the way the governor reported aid in his January presentation. You can look down here and see 
Last year, we received uh, just about $50.5 million in foundation aid. That indicates 82% of our fully paid uh, amount of money. Last year, we were shorted about $11 million alone last year. If you look over the past seven years, uh, we have been shortchanged about $50 million from the state of New York relative to that initial foundation aid formula. What I'll say about this is I want to thank our business office and our, our finance team last year at this time. That fully funded number for last year was closer to 78%. And thanks to a lot of the hard work that happened through the months of February and March last year, we saw a significant increase in state aid from January to April. Uh, hopefully some of those same lobby efforts will pay off this year and we'll see a little bit more funding. But that $59 million number, if you look year over year, it looks like we are receiving uh, roughly $9 million more in foundation aid this year than last year, and we are not. That, that big bump also incorporates uh, our BOCES aid and other things that used to be broken out. So two things that are important to notice about this slide, it looks like we're 100% funded because they are now calling uh, your foundation aid payable amount and your foundation aid paid amount are lining up this year. Last year, our foundation aid payable was $61.6 million. That's the amount of money we should have received. Our foundation aid paid was $50.5 million. This year on paper, our foundation aid payable is $59.1 million. We're receiving $59.1 million. So they've made some changes to make it look like uh, we're 100% funded. We, don't, we aren't sure if that means they've reset the bar or not but that's kind of where we are right now relative to foundation aid. As we move into the future relative to revenue and funding, um, I just wanna talk about a, a little bit of where we're going. This slide shows eight different things. The top two lines are the two more important lines, our total revenues and our total expenditures. And this plays out 10 years from now. Uh, if everything stays the same as it is now, assuming uh, roughly a 2% tax increase per year, uh, a, an average state aid increase of about 3.5% per year, um, a relative uh, health and insurance benefits increases about 6% a year. Uh, right now we're seeing average increases about 10 to 12% a year, so 6% is probably uh, a little bit too lenient on that. You'll start to see this trend of where we wind up in about 10 years. Um, our estimated expenditures in about 10 years will be north of close to $180 million, while our revenues will be somewhere in the ballpark of $140 million. So in about 10 years, we're projecting out, if nothing changes, we continue on the trend lines that we're on relative to expenditures and uh, revenues, about a $40 million shortfall. This is not just Rome. If you've paid attention to the news media, Rochester City Schools have been undergoing some significant financial struggles this year and are planning some major financial struggles for next year. I think in the coming weeks and months, you'll hear more about local school districts also struggling with making their revenues and expenditures uh, line up as they move into the future. The last thing I want to talk about relative to our revenue budget is most districts, including Rome, we do use our reserves to help uh, bridge the gap when it comes down to the budget. This graph here, this chart shows two lines. This is the, the, the lines indicate the 50th percentile of the 57 small city school districts. The uh, horizontal line that you see here talks about the districts that are above that line. Are, um, that's foundation aid funded, so they are the top 50% uh, relative to their foundation aid funding. And then your vertical line talks about the total number of dollars you have in reserves as compared to your budget. You can see where our Rome logo is. We fall uh, obviously way below the reserve number. We have about 10% of our, our budget in reserves, and uh, our percent fully funded of foundation aid is in the low 80% range, but that still puts us below the 50th percentile for the small city school districts. What I'm trying to highlight here is we have some districts in New York State, especially in that top right quadrant, you can see the number of districts in small cities that are funded very well relative to their full funding at Foundation Aid, but also have a significant uh, amount of money in their savings accounts and in their reserves to be able to fund their budgets. And this is one of the things that we're going to lobby hard for in Albany is that you have some districts like Rome and others that are using a lot of reserves to offset the lack of funding that's coming from Albany while you have districts that are receiving a lot of funding from Albany and in turn putting that money 
into their reserves to make sure that they don't have problems. So the issue is less that the money doesn't exist. There is plenty of money to be had. It needs to be distributed better so that districts in our case are not using our reserves all the time because we are shortchanged. And as you can see, uh, we are one of probably 10 school districts of the small city schools that are in that boat of we have dwindling reserves because we're trying to offset that lack of state funding. Our next topic of conversation today is the actual proposed budget for 2020-2021. Uh, and one thing that's important to know about the proposed budget number is this is a starting point for the year. This number will change between now and the approved budget by the Board of Education in April. Uh, and it, it should be slightly less than this as well. That is our anticipation. However, uh, it's good for people to know where we're starting uh, how we got there and what we're looking at. So for the 2020-2021 proposed budget, uh, we are currently proposing a budget number of $124,793,138. Uh, and if you look back a few years, you can see that this is a uh, roughly $8 million increase over this current operating year's budget. Uh, and you can see, you know, two years ago, we did have a slight decrease from two years ago to this year's operating budget. We uh, hopefully are all familiar with those memories of last year and no one wants to go through those again. Um, some things of note here, the benefit codes, uh, the 800 codes you see on the comparison slide are increasing uh, $2 million. That includes all forms of benefits that we have throughout the district. The uh, payroll codes also going up roughly uh, $3.5 million. In any given organization, uh, your two largest expenses are your employee costs, whether it be salary, uh, whether it be benefits, uh, those are the costs that increase the most. Everything else kind of throughout the codes of, of uh, expenditure increases are up slightly. Uh, you do see uh, the total increases roughly uh, $8 million for this point of year. Also talk a little bit of history when we look at our expenditures per pupil. We mentioned this early on. Here's a graphic that just kind of shows you. Uh, these are the school districts that are within both the Madison Oneida Boces and Oneida County. Uh, all of them laid out. These are total expenditures per pupil. Right now, Rome uh, is letter S on this chart. So we are second to last in our region for expenditures per pupil. Uh, we highlight this to show the fact that we do control expenditures. Four years ago, when I started as superintendent, Rome was uh, District D on this chart. We were the fourth highest spending district per pupil. Uh, and so over four years time, we've worked to reduce expenditures to make sure we aren't frivolously spending money uh, on things that may or may not be needed. It's been a lot of tireless work for our staff, our teachers, our administrators and support staff have all worked hard to reduce their expenditures and that hard work pays off. As you can see, uh, this is a positive for the district that we are controlling expenditures uh, and, and doing what we can uh, to make sure we aren't having to increase tax taxes throughout the district and, and have shortfalls in revenue. As we look at the, uh, the codes themselves, the current year versus the proposed, this kind of breaks down the major different areas and you can see where the increases come. Uh, instructionally, there's uh, about a $4 million increase in instructional codes are your teachers, your teaching assistants, our special education department, anything relative to athletics, uh, nursing guidance. Most of the instructional code is your uh, staff, your teachers, and people that are doing day-to-day -day work relative to instruction with kids in the school. Administration codes are the ones that tend to get the, uh, you hear the word administration, people want to think that's all the salaries and benefits for people like myself and those that are our administrators in schools, but it is much more than that. Uh, think about the term administration relative to the administration of the school district itself. So that's our board of education expenses, our school administrators, but all of our auditing uh, expenditures for all of our audits, our legal expenses that we have, our administration costs for our Madison and Boces, any professional development that we conduct throughout the district, our personnel related things, all of our business office, our data department, taxing department. So there's a lot that rolls into administration. Those expenditures, we do plan to see an increase of also about a million dollars uh, for the year. It's about a 10% increase. Central services is simply related to our maintenance of shop custodians, um, making sure our properties are up to date and well kept. Transportation is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you can see a slight increase in transportation expenses planned for next year. That service is simply paying off bills uh, for school districts. That's mostly related to uh, payments for building projects of the past. So we do see a slight decrease in that plan for next year. Our benefit codes, again, we've talked about that a little bit. 
you've got your employee health insurance benefits, um, benefits related to um, anything from pension requirements from the state, uh, health insurance, uh, workers' comp benefits, those types of things. Total increase you can see is just about a 6.9% increase. And again, I want to highlight that that $124,793,138 budget number is a starting point. That is not where we uh, intend to have an approved, a voter approved budget come a few months, but that's where we are as of today. One of the things that's important for school districts and for us all to know, and we talk about this every year, is by law, school districts are required to balance their budget. And that means we have to show you a budget that has an expenditure side and a revenue side that line up. Uh, that's very different than government, federal government, state government, county government, local governments. They do not have to do that. They present a spending plan and their spending plans are not even required to be voted on by taxpayers. Uh, they're under a much different set of circumstances that make it much easier to operate. However, we have to talk to you about how we balance that budget. So as you noticed, uh, our, our proposed current budget is roughly $124 million. Our revenue side does not even come close to lining up to that. It was in the ballpark of $114 million. So you have uh, some differences there that have to be made out. Simple math uh, sh demonstration for you here, I'm sorry, uh, is to show you a little bit about our revenue expense comparison. A few months ago, when we started looking at our budget uh, and we took into account everything that people within the district uh, were asking for that was new, uh, our expenditure budget would have been roughly $129 million. Uh, we first went through and took out anything that was requested that was new that we're not doing currently. That reduced our initial budget by roughly $4.6 million, and that's how we got down to our current $124.7 million budget. Uh, we are looking at an estimated revenue of just shy of $114 million. Uh, a local tax increase of roughly $738,000 combined with allocating uh, what we can from our reserves to stay within the 4% uh, requirement. Uh, that's roughly $2.7 million. You add up all those revenues, those three revenues, and our current deficit as of today is $7,461,188. So that's really the number right now that we're talking about. How do we minimize that number a little bit? Uh, and that will be done by requiring us to reduce our current expenditure budget. Some ideas that will be discussed uh, in the coming weeks and months as we talk about um, are things like talking about health insurance changes to our bargaining units and our staff. Uh, we feel we can save roughly $1.5 million in doing some things different with insurance. That is a challenge because it requires bargaining units to vote on adjustments to their contracts. Uh, but I do know our staff, I do know our people uh, want to see the greater good uh, be successful. And with the right information and equipped with the right information and things that are beneficial for all parties and mostly beneficial for kids, that's most important, uh, I do think we can make some, some grounds there. We will be discussing the possibility of closing one of our buildings. Uh, we feel if we close a building, we can save roughly $1.5 million. Uh, again, these are preliminary conversations. We haven't done a lot of research and, and uh, math figures to these yet, uh, but we do think that by closing one of the schools, uh, we could see a cost savings of roughly $1.5 million. The rest of these things are smaller in nature. Such things, uh, these happen every year. We talk about the possibility of cutting after school programming, extra class things. Uh, right now, we currently operate some of our buildings on Sundays. If we close our district operations completely on Sundays, meaning uh, we are a six-day-a-week operation instead of seven, uh, we feel we can save roughly $100,000, uh, possibly removing $100,000 out of our furniture uh, expenses, field trip reductions, uh, K-12, again, modified sports. We talked about that last year would save the district roughly $141,000. And then another option would be to talk about uh, our universal pre-K program uh, would save us just shy of $600,000. All of these things on this list right here, if they were to happen, and I don't believe that they will, but if they were, it would save us $4,190,000. What I would say is, again, relative to pre-K, it comes up a lot. People need to understand that $590,000 is the amount of money that our taxpayers are paying for pre-K that's above the state grant. There's a misconception that the state pays for pre-K. It is grant funded. While it is grant funded, the grant does not cover the entire cost. Our district picks up uh, the rest of that burden. If you think about what a tax increase would be this year, $730,000. 
almost the entire tax increase would go to supporting that pre-K program if you want to try and put things as a dollar dollar comparison. Uh, no one wants to see things like that happen and that's hopefully the type of stuff that gets our legislators to work hard for more funding so that we don't have to make decisions like that. Uh, but trying to put things in perspective for you. If all of these things happen, and again, I do not believe that they will, that $4 million uh, reduction would reduce our deficit to uh, $3,271,188. Again, $3.2 million is still a long way to go. A worst case scenario, and we have talked about this, we could allocate all of our reserves for the year, which is $7.5 million. Uh, and we might not have to do any of this. Uh, and we might have a good budget year. However, what that will do for next year is mean we have zero dollars in the bank to be able to um, have fix this problem again next year because this problem will be there next year that the revenue is not matching the expenditure. Using our savings as a source of revenue is helpful, but it doesn't help the problem long term. It will make the problem worse for next year. One thing I do want to answer uh, I do get asked a lot, if we just use all of our reserves, is that going to help our foundation aid formula for next year? And the answer is no. Our reserve amounts in the bank have no play on foundation aid. The two are not linked. It is not a factor in the foundation aid formula. It's not a factor in state aid from the governor's office. The two uh, numbers are completely detached. Uh, therefore, we can't even say that using all of our reserves will then in turn uh, draw in greater revenue for next year. The last thing I want to highlight for you relative to this slide and building a new normal, when you look at these reductions, you will notice that there is no reduction of staff on this chart for this year. Last year at this time, we, propo we proposed uh, solving our budget crisis with a reduction of 81 positions. This year, uh, while there's always room to maybe make reductions, we are doing our best to avoid uh, affecting our staff and making sure that our students have the support that they need throughout the district uh, pre-K-12 to ensure that our students get what they need and that they have the resources available to them in terms of human capital uh, to provide that education. I would love to be able to sit here in February and tell you that we will not have any staff reductions. Uh, I can't say that at this point in time. However, Initially, we are not talking about that as a cost-saving measure to help budge, uh, bridge the, the budget gap that we have this year. We're hopeful we can do that through some creative uh, operational changes, such as building a new normal. What does a, a school district look like that has uh, some new configurations, some new ways of doing things, uh, and some new concepts, and, and then also possibly using some more reserves than we might want to, but to save jobs. Uh, that is our goal for the year. As we start to wind down the presentation, we've talked previously about the tax levy for the year. Uh, we are proposing a 2.1% tax levy increase uh, that would move the tax levy for this year to $35,898,233 for a difference of $738,543 for the year, and that is a 2.1% uh, change. That 2.1% does indicate the governor's tax cap. Uh, that is important for uh, folks both within the school district and the taxpaying community to understand. Uh, the governor's tax cap is a formula that um, uh, tells you how much you can tax. This is the maximum amount of taxes we can raise. Even if 80% uh, of a community came forward and said, we want to raise more money than that to try and save programs, uh, we would not recommend raising more than that cap because if we go over the cap, uh, everybody in the community would lose the star rebate check. And uh, we don't think that's fair. We don't think that's appropriate. But it is one of the tricks that the governor has in play to uh, minimize the amount of revenue that a school district can raise. So really, as you see, our opportunities for revenue are minimal. Uh, tax increases generally on average are about 2% uh, a year across the state. And then our revenue from the state itself and how that's determined, we don't have any say in. We're not like a, a business or industry that can start creating new products to sell. We can't change our costs on uh, whatever it might be that we're trying to sell. We just don't have those options. We're completely at the mercy of the tax cap law, the tax levy, and the, the aid formulas. How the taxes look, if you fast forward and play them out relative to the different municipalities uh, here within the Rome City School District, you can see in this slide there is the actual uh, rate for 2019-2020, the projected rate for 2020-2021. Uh, you have the dollar change in rate and then the percent of the tax base for each community. The column in the middle is the equalization rate. Equalization rate is something that's not managed by the school district. It's a number that's given to us, and that is meant to 
uh, for lack of a better term, level the playing field between the different municipalities within any given school district uh, to make sure that no one faction of the school district is paying more in school taxes than another. Uh, it's a very complicated process. Uh, if you want more information on equalization rate, tax rates, things of that nature, there are links. Uh, the full PowerPoint presentation is on our website. You can view the full PowerPoint presentation. It has links uh, to all of those things within it, so you can learn more about those if you would like. There's also slides within the tax portion of the presentation that talk about the tax rates per uh, thousand of assessed property, uh, 50,000 of assessed property, or 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 of assessed properties uh, within the presentation online if you would like to see those tax rate issues. Uh, however, in, in summing that up, uh, the tax impact for the year, uh, we are proposing a 2.1% increase in property taxes. In summing up our 2020-2021 budget, uh, if we roll everything over we're currently doing and add all the things that people wanted to do that were innovative, we would have had about a $129 million budget. Uh, our additional revenue that we have coming in through uh, projected uh, state aid increases and proposed tax increases does not even cover our uh, health insurance costs. Uh, proposed reductions within the budget could reduce our expenditures by $4 million. Um, our proposed budget does utilize $2.75 million in current savings to uh, balance the gap a little bit. A balanced budget for this year uh, would increase the use of our fund balance to a negative $1,980,563, reducing our remaining fund balance to $0. That basically means if we didn't make any further changes and we totally used our savings, uh, we would have negative almost $2 million in the bank uh, moving forward. And reminder, the governor has reset the foundation aid formulas. Things are very different this year than they have been in the back in the past. Uh, our current proposed budget still has a remaining deficit of $7.4 million. Uh, for next year, if we do balance the budget uh, without using our, our savings, uh, we do project a deficit to start 2021-2022, planning at roughly $13 million based on the trends that we're seeing right now with expenses and revenues. If you think back to last year at this time, we were projecting a $9 million deficit to start the planning. I think uh, earlier in the presentation, you saw that the deficit was about $10 million. So our projections have been pretty accurate over recent years relative to where we have been and where we think we're going. Uh, there are moving parts still. That's why this is a proposal. Uh, and we are in the know that things are going to change. There are retirements that could come in that help us reduce our, our staff expenditures uh, or resignations, folks that might move on to other locations or move out of state. Uh, and the state adopted budget also changes a lot of things, uh, and that happens in early April. Uh, you could see increase in state aid through that, which will help uh, close that gap a little bit. By law, a reminder, we are required to balance this budget, so we have to show you expenditures and revenues that match. And we will continue to work on conversations with our legislators, uh, both at the local and state level, to see what we can do while we continue to investigate options uh, with the Board of Education for reducing our expenditures to ensure that uh, we are not having to use all of our savings to make sure that we balance a budget. Um, and those are the things, those are the conversations that will happen in the, the next eight weeks and um, through many, many meetings. And you will be updated all throughout that process as the budget evolves and changes uh, until we get to the final point of having a finalized uh, proposed budget. As we look forward, some of the things that are important to note on the budget vote or when you do go to the polls in May, uh, there are other propositions. So currently, uh, there will be a proposition for uh, Board of Education seats. There will be three open seats uh, for the 2020-2021 school year. Each of the three seats has a three-year term. Uh, and if you're interested, the deadline for submitting your uh, petition, your candidate petition, is April 29th of this year. Any information and anything you need is available at our business office. We do anticipate there to be two uh, possible other propositions on the uh, docket in May, one would be for the sale of Fort Stanwix is a possible proposition you will see. Another possible proposition will be will be the additional uh, the addition of a 10th non-voting school board member to a, be a Rome Free Academy student. Uh, both of those items need to be voted on by the community. Uh, we are in the works of trying to develop those propositions. Um, not quite there yet as of today. However, I want to make you aware that it is possible that you will see additional propositions on your uh, budget vote when it comes time for May. Of note, where you're voting, uh, the poll locations are the same as they were in December for the uh, school referendum vote. 
The budget vote this year is Tuesday, May 19th, 2020 from 9 a.m. till 8 p.m. at any one of the 10 wards. If you have further questions or you have uh, information that you need, please don't hesitate to contact my office or our business office. Again, our presentation is available in full. Uh, the slide deck is available in full on our website. Uh, please feel free to visit that. There are many uh, presentations of this live uh, throughout the community in the coming weeks. We will do budget update videos also as we go through. In closing, I want to thank everybody for the hard work that we do on a daily basis. Budget time is never a, a great time for anyone, especially if you remember the trials and tribulations of last year. I do feel we're in a better place this year. We have some work to do uh, and some tough decisions to make in the coming weeks. However, I do think that we can get there. One thing that we have to remember is that we are here for kids. Uh, sometimes sacrifice of ourselves for the greater good is needed. And I do think if we look internally to what we can do differently to build a new normal uh, and manage ourselves, we can benefit our kids and our community greatly. Uh, in closing, I thank you all for your time. I look forward to the continued work that we're going to do with the Board of Education relative to getting you a completely balanced proposed budget. And I hope you have a wonderful uh, and enjoyable day.